systemic pathology, which is the diseases of the lymphoreticular system. In our lecture today, uh, of course, we will uh, cover the lymphoreticular system in two lectures, uh, today lecture and tomorrow, inshallah. Uh, the lymphoreticular system, we will start with introduction about, a uh, brief introduction about uh, what is the lymphoreticular system, and then we will take the most important aspect in uh, lymphoreticular system, which are the lymph nodes, brief uh, uh, review about the histology of the normal lymph nodes, and then we will go to the, uh, the most important uh, pathological condition in, uh, that may affect the lymph nodes, which are the lymphadenopathy, which means enlargement of the lymph node. And then we will take an example uh, about benign condition that may uh, cause reactive lymphadenopathy, which is the infectious mononucleosis, after that, we will start with uh, the beginning or introduction about the neoplastic proliferation of the white blood cells. Okay. After that, we will take uh, the last uh, subject in our lecture today, which is the geological and pathological factors in uh, white cell neoplasm. So, at the beginning, what is the lymphoreticular system? The lymphoreticular system is involved in the defense of the body against microorganisms and foreign substances. That's to say, the immune response. So, the lymphoreticular system is the heart of the immune cells. You take in the, uh, the immune cells, uh, we discuss in immune pathology, we discuss the lymphocytes, B and T lymphocytes, we discuss the natural care cells, lymphatic cells, and plasma cells, and so on. All these uh, immune cells, they have home. They have areas in the body where they live, okay? And these areas, we call it the lymphoreticular system. So the lymphoreticular system are the tissues that contain the immune cells of our body. And this system is divided uh, into many organs, especially we have uh, the most important organs include the thymus, which is uh, a, a gland that is located in the uh, mediastinal area behind the sternum. And we have also the spleen, we have the lymph nodes, we have the mucosa associated lymphoid tissue, and we have the bone marrow. And as you know from previous lectures, that the thymus and the bone marrow are called the primary uh, organs of the lymphoreticular system, thymus and bone marrow, where there will be maturation of the lymphocytes. When uh, the maturation of the lymphocytes occur in the bone marrow, we call these lymphocytes are B lymphocytes. And the maturation of the lymphocytes occur in the thymus, we call it T lymphocytes, okay? And the other organs, which are the spleen, lymph nodes, and the, the mucosa associated lymphoid tissue, as you know that in many organs, such as the GI system, the upper respiratory tract system, uh, the urinary system, everywhere in the body, we have certain uh, lymphoid stations, okay? In the GI, in the respiratory, in the uh, other organs, we call it mouth tissue or mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. So the mouth with the lymph nodes and the spleen, they are considered as secondary uh, lymphoreticular uh, organs. In this secondary lymphoreticular organs, the, where the maturation of the lymphocytes in the thymus and the bone marrow, they will uh, leave the thymus and the bone marrow and go to these secondary organs. So we have the primary organs where there is maturation of the lymphocytes in there, which are the thymus and the bone marrow. Then we have secondary organs where these mature lymphocytes and other immune cells will go and live there. Okay. Uh, the most important uh, organ that we will cover in our uh, lectures in the diseases of the lymphoreticular system, we will discuss the lymph nodes extensively, and we will have uh, a brief idea about the diseases of the thymus, okay, and the other uh, the other uh, organs such as the mouth tissue and the spleen will, will be will be discussed in other uh, in other courses, okay. So what are the lymph nodes? The lymph nodes are uh, stations where uh, the, the, they check the, uh, the lymphatic, okay, for any foreign substances. You know that the lymph nodes are the bean-shaped uh, structures. They are like the bean, okay? They have concave area and they have convex area. The convex area, there is a, a, a lymphatic, we call it apparent, okay? Apparent, it means they, 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 they receive the lymphatic through these apparent lymphatic vessels, okay? They are called apparent lymphatics, okay? They drain the lymph into these lymphoid stations. And we have efferent, efferent where the lymphatics after 
or the lymph after fertil uh, filtration inside the lymph nodes will go out of the uh, lymph node. Okay, uh, these apparent lymphatics will uh, will give the lymph into the uh, lymph nodes, and this apparent lymphatics first of all will drain into what you call sinuses. Okay, these apparent they have uh, valves and they will drain the lymph into the subcapsular sinus. What do we mean by sinus? The sinus are like the lymphatic vessels but the lymph nodes. So inside the lymph node, we don't call them lymphatic vessels. We call it sinuses. So everywhere when you hear the word sinus, it means vessels inside the lymph node. Okay, we have subcapsular sinus, we have trabecular sinus, and we have medullary sinuses. All these sinuses are, uh, in fact, they are vessels, but we don't call them vessels. We call them sinuses because they are inside this structure of the lymph node, okay? This uh, lymphatics uh, or the, these uh, vessels will carry the lymph uh, uh, and uh, they, will, they will be checked by the tissue of the lymph node. The main areas of the lymph node, we have cortex, which means the outer area of the lymph node, we call it cortex. Muted. The recording has started. Every other organ, like the lungs, like uh, in the GI system, in the mesentery, like uh, in everywhere, trachea, everywhere inside our body, we have deep lymph nodes uh, around the stomach, around the small bowel, around the oesophagus. All these internal organs, they contain uh, deep lymph nodes, but these deep lymph nodes, we cannot uh, make them uh, uh, physical examination or any palpation. But the, the peripheral area, the cervical axillary and inguinal could be uh, examined in physical examination as doctors, and they are uh, seldomly palpable. And yani usually they are either not palpable or they are very small uh, lymph nodes. The primary function, as you know, uh, they are entrapping any foreign agents or any uh, unwanted materials, and they will uh, start eliciting an immune response. For any foreigners that uh, are entering the lymph nodes through these sinuses, uh, uh, they will be cached by the immune cells that are located in the lymph nodes, and they will uh, start alarming the body about this foreigner and starting the immune response against it. Okay? so. What we mean by the term lymphadenopathy? What we, lymphadenopathy, it means lymph node enlargement, okay? Yani when we make a physical examination of the neck, the axilla, the guanal area, we can see palpable lymph nodes, we can, uh, we can sense these lymph nodes by our hand, it means that there is lymph node enlargement. This lymph node enlargement, it means that the patient has lymphadenopathy. And this lymph node enlargement mainly have two main causes, okay, or what we call it reactive lymphadenopathy, okay, or it could be neoplastic condition, okay, and it could be tumorous condition, and usually this tumor is malignant tumors, okay, but it is either reactive, benign, and this reactive condition either acute inflammation, okay, we call it acute lymphadenitis, or it could be a chronic condition, we call it chronic lymphadenopathy. While the neoplastic or uh, conditions, uh, it could be either primary disease uh, or primary neoplasm or secondary neoplasm. What do we mean by primary neoplasm? It means neoplasm that originating from the cells of the lymph node. And this primary neoplasm of the lymph nodes, we call it lymphoma. Okay, lymphoma, it means malignant neoplastic uh, condition that arises from the cells of the lymph node, okay? And it could be secondary ne neoplastic condition. It could be a tumor that arising from other tissue and they make metastasis to the lymph nodes. As you know that most of the carcinoma, they can make metastasis and this usually will go to the lymphatic vessels and they will go to the lymph nodes and this is called secondary neoplastic condition of the lymph nodes. So we will discuss these uh, subjects uh, in our lectures today. 
so first of all, we have acute lymphadenitis, okay? Oh, so usually it is non-specific. What do we mean by non-specific? It means that there's no specific organism. It could be any viral, any bacterial infection that may cause this condition, okay? It may be focal, confined to a local group of lymph nodes and training a focal infection, or it could be generalized when there is bacterial or viral infection. Focal, it means like uh, someone having tooth abscess or someone having uh, abscess in the hand or someone having leg abscess, for example, that there will be focal uh, lymphadenitis in the area draining these lymph nodes. While generalized, it could be when patient having viral, systemic viral or systemic bacterial infection, it could have acute uh, generalized lymphadenitis. So grossly, what we can see grossly, you can see there is a swelling. And it all, yeah, in acute lymphadenitis, we can see all the signs of acute inflammation, which are swelling, tenderness, uh, hotness, redness, okay, and uh, sometimes abscess formation, you can see, this is, uh, yani, grossly, uh, there is acute inflammation in this uh, lymph nodes. Uh, microscopically, we have uh, large germinal centers, these areas of B lymphocyte, there will be enlargement of the germinal centers of the lymphoid follicle, and also we may have a neutrophilic infiltration, you can see, these are the neutrophils infiltrating the germinal centers of the lymph node and again we may have some necrosis inside the the germinal centers that may result in the formation of abscess formation inside the germinal center so this is the uh, the morphology of acute non-specific lymphadenitis it usually uh, the microorganism is non-specific any viral any bacterial infection may cause this condition in chronic uh, non-specific lymphadenitis, it may take three forms. Yani in chronic lymphadenopathy or chronic lymphadenitis, we may have the three patterns of, uh, of or three morphological patterns. These are called, first of all, we have follicular hyperplasia. What do we mean by follicular hyperplasia? There will be enlargement of the lymphoid follicles. As we see in the cortex of the lymph node, we have the lymphoid follicles, and these lymphoid follicles are the home of the B lymphocyte. So in follicular hyperplasia, it occurs in inflammatory condition that activate the B lymphocyte. For any inflammatory condition that are mainly activating the B lymphocyte, there will be enlargement of the lymphoid follicle. And these lymphoid follicles are located in the cortex of the lymph node. So we will have a pattern, we call it follicular hyperplasia. Okay? So it could be seen in many conditions, but mainly could be seen in, in the rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune disease involved in the joints, and also in toxoplasmosis, which is an infection that may occur uh, due to uh, exposure to the caps. And again, in early stages of HIV infection. These are uh, the main uh, conditions or examples about the condition that may cause follicular hyperplasia. You can see in this picture, this is a uh, pattern of follicular hyperplasia. We will, this lymphoid follicle will be increased in number, there will be increase in size, they will become variable in size. Some of them are small, some of them are large. So they will have a germinal centers, active germinal centers, because this uh, uh, inflammatory condition triggering uh, mainly the B lymphocytes. And these B lymphocytes are living in the lymphoid follicles. So they are starting to uh, uh, to become activated, they become uh, increase in number and increase in the size. So these are areas that will undergo uh, active uh, active enlargement and active uh, uh, hyperplasia. So we call it a follicular hyperplasia pattern. This is a pattern of follicular hyperplasia. So what we can see, there will be large germinal centers with an, a mantle zone in the periphery. And in these uh, uh, lymph nodes, we will have a preservation of the lymph node architecture. What we mean by preservation of lymph node architecture, it means that the lymph nodes is still having a cortex, still having a medulla, still having a paracortical area. But the cortex, there will be hyperplastic, it will be enlarged, it will be increased in number, increase in size of the follicles because of the activation of the Again, we have variation in the size and the shape of the lymphoid follicles. These lymphoid follicles will become variable in size and shape. There is mixed 
lymphocytes at different stages of differentiation. These germinal centers contain lymphocytes at different stages of differentiation from immature to uh, somewhat mature B, uh, B lymphocyte because the B lymphocyte, after leaving the pulmonal, it may undergo additional maturation inside the lymph node. Again, we have a, a prominent parasitic and mitotic activity in the germinal centers. This uh, active replication will result in some debris, and these debris will be phagocytosed by the macrophages. Okay, uh, and this active uh, also mitosis. What we mean by mitosis? It means a division of cells. Okay, this is uh, this activity are prominent in the germinal centers. The other pattern, we call it paracortical hyperplasia. In this pattern from Spain, paracortical hyperplasia, it means the paracortical area of the lymph node will undergo enlargement. And this is, occurs mainly when the, 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 the inflammatory condition mainly triggering the T-cell response, okay? It is characterized by reactive changes in the T-cell region of the lymph node. And as we said, the T-cell region of the lymph node are the paracortical area. So when we have, for example, viral infection, such as Ipsian by virus, certain vaccination, such as smallpox vaccine, certain drugs such as phenytoin, these conditions result in triggering or activation of the T-cell response. And this activation of the T-cell response will result in enlargement of the paracortical area because the paracortical area are the home of the T-lymphocytes. So when these T-lymphocytes become active and become uh, triggered by this inflammatory condition, there will be enlargement of mainly of the paracortical area. Microscopically, there will be expansion of the paracortical area by immunoblast. This immunoblast, it means the cells that will give rise to the T-lymphocyte. Immunoblast, they are the primitive cells that are giving rise to the T-lymphocyte. And this expansion will efface the lymphoid follicles. You can see in this lecture picture, the main area of expansion are the paracortical area. We have residual lymphoid follicles, but these lymphoid follicles not the main area of of of, uh, of enlargement. The main area of enlargement are the cells in between the lymphoid follicles, which we are calling the paracortical area. This is the medullary area, and this is the cortical area. You can see the expansion is mainly in the para cortical area due to activation of the t lymphocyte. Also, there will be hyperplasia of uh, mononuclear uh, phagocytic uh, cells in the lymph lymphatic sinuses. In the lymphatic sinuses, as we said, we have sinuses where the efferent lymphatics drain into the lymph node, and these uh, lymphatic sinuses, like this subcapsular sinus and this is the trabecular sinus, it contains uh, mononuclear cells, uh, which are the macrophages. This macrophages also will undergo uh, activation and replication. Okay, so this is the difference between the follicular hyperplasia, where the main trigger are uh, triggering the B lymphocyte, okay, and the paracortical area where the main trigger is uh, include the T lymphocyte. The, the follicular hyperplasia mainly occurs in toxoplasmosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and in early stages of HIV infection, while the paracortical hyperplasia occurs usually in viral infection or some vaccination or in cases of certain drugs like chemotoin and other drugs. We have a third pattern of hyperplasia which involves the medullary area of the lymph node, and this pattern we call it sinus histocytosis. So in this pattern, we don't have expansion uh, of the cortex or the paracortical area. We just have an expansion of the medullary area. Okay, so it is characterized by distension and prominence of the lymphatic sinuses or sinusoids due to uh, marked hypertrophy of the lining endothelial cell and infiltration of by histocytes. So in the medullary area, as we said, we have a sinuses, which are the vessels uh, inside the medulla of the lymph node. This vessels will undergo hyperplasia uh, and hypertrophy. There was hypertrophy of the lining endothelial cell. Uh, of course, we cannot see these details uh, because it needs higher magnification, but the, the endothelial cells lining these uh, lymphatic sinus sinusoids will undergo hyperplasia and hypertrophy. Again, we have infiltration by histiocyte. We have macrophages infiltrating the the sinuses. So we can see there is expansion of these sinuses by these macrophages and by these endothelial cells. And uh, this condition mainly seen in lymph nodes draining sinus uh, cancers uh, as an immune response to the tumor or in lymph nodes draining some inflammatory lesions. Yani this uh, pattern of, uh, of uh, chronic lymphadenopathy, it is seen in the areas of draining cancer, not due to metastasis, but due to uh,
of the body against the tumor cells. We can see this sign of cystocytosis, or sometimes we can see other uh, inflammatory conditions that may be activating the macrophages. Macroscopically, there is expansion of the sinuses by proliferation of the large histocytes containing phagocytic or macro uh, or uh, phagocytic debris inside these sinuses. So, in chronic lymphadenopathy, either we have follicular hyperplasia or paracortical hyperplasia, or we have a sinus histiocytosis. We may have other patterns uh, in which there is uh, enlargement of the lymph node. And these other patterns may include granulomatous pattern. You take this pattern, the granuloma, in the, uh, the first course, you can, you can you see that the granuloma is seen in many conditions like tuberculosis, uh, in, in, in syphilis, uh, in fungal infection, toxoplasmosis, or in sarcoidosis. You can see they may have many granulomas. And these granuloma, as you know, they are uh, composed of activated. Uh, macrophages, we call them uh, epithelioid cells, okay, and they are surrounded by lymphocytes and some fibroblasts. And this granuloma it could be caseating, it contains uh, caseating necrosis, uh, like in TB, or it could be non caseating, like in this example. This is an example of non caseating granulomas, and this non caseating granulomas are seen in many conditions, mainly in sarcoidosis, okay. So these are lymphadenopathy that are characterized by the presence of a granuloma which is an aggregation of histiocytes as a prominent feature. So this is a granuloma replacing the architecture of the lymph node by these ball-like structures. This is uh, another pattern that may occur in a certain types of uh, chronic lymphadenopathy. We have another pattern we call it suppurative granuloma. The, the term suppurative, and yani everywhere when you hear a suppurative, it means any yani, pus formation or abscess formation. Okay, so separation it means the presence of ex or extensive presence of a neutrophil. Okay, sometimes with even with necrosis. Uh, this is uh, a suppurative granuloma. It means neutrophil within, within, within the necrosis of the granuloma. And uh, here the necrosis is it is not a caseate necrosis, but it is a coagulative type of necrosis, okay, or a uh, liquefactive type of necrosis. This is a liquefactive type of necrosis where there is uh, active uh, infection, and this active infection will result in uh, liquefaction of the center of the granuloma. You can see this is a granuloma-like structure, and inside the granuloma we have this uh, necrosis, liquefactive necrosis, where there is uh, a neutrophilic infiltration inside the center of these granulomas. So this pattern of suppurative granulomas also may result in uh, lymph node enlargement, and uh, example of which include cancer cry disease, which is mainly uh, seen in young patients with generalized lymphadenopathy, uh, patients presenting fever, lymph node enlargement. It is also seen in those having uh, dead animals inside their homes because of the exposure to certain type of bacteria. And also we have a lymphogranuloma pinea, which is uh, some sort of sexual transmitted disease, mainly seen in adult male, due to chlamydia infection. Okay, it results in a lymph node enlargement mainly of the lymphoid area. Also we have Yersinia uh, pseudotuberculosis, which is uh, seen in the mesenteric lymph nodes in the young adult, and it gives uh, a clinical picture that resembles the acute appendicitis. Okay, so Yersinia the infection, uh, the clinical differential diagnosis this include acute appendicitis. It is a certain type of microorganisms that result in mesenteric lymphadenopathy. As we said, we have a deep lymph nodes, and from these deep lymph nodes, the lymph nodes that are located are in the mesentery of the bowel. And these, when they, when they have infection by this microorganism, may result in uh, abdominal pain, vomiting, fever, and these pictures uh, and localization of pain, uh, it is very similar to the picture of acute appendicitis, so it may it is a one of the differential diagnoses that you will, you will take, inshallah, in, uh, in, surgery, in the surgery uh, lectures, the, the, the differential diagnosis of appendicitis, one of them are the Yersinia infection. Okay, this is the granuloma, as we said, and this is granuloma containing neutrophils, and this is neutrophil uh, with necrotic debris uh, inside the center of the granuloma. This pattern we call it suppurative granuloma. So mainly we have either acute lymphadenopathy, okay, uh, or acute lymphadenitis, or we have a chronic lymphadenopathy. Chronic lymphadenopathy, uh, either follicular hyperplasia, paracortical hyperplasia, or sinus histocytosis. The other patterns where the lymph node enlargement, it could be granulomatous pattern.
tuberculosis and other condition or it could be due to a uh, security granular uh, like this one uh, also it is seen uh, in classic right disease and venereum uh, and senior infection these all these are reactive all these are benign condition all these uh, are inflammatory condition that when we uh, take a uh, good uh, treatment like antibiotic and anti-inflammatory agents all of them will be uh, disappeared and the patient can return uh, back uh, to uh, the normal condition. We will take a, a good example about the reactive lymphadenopathy, which is an important subject, which is called infectious mononucleosis. Okay, so what we mean by infectious mononucleosis? Infectious mononucleosis, it is a disease or it is uh, a, a condition uh, which is an acute self limited disease of adolescent and young adults that is caused by exposure to a virus which is called Epstein Barr virus, EPV virus which is an Epstein Barr virus, which is a member of the herpes virus family. So it is an acute condition, acute inflammatory condition, self-limited. What do you mean by self-limited? Yani in most of uh, conditions, it will be uh, yani, uh, treated yani, or it go without treatment or with some separative treatment, and yani in most conditions. Sometimes it needs uh, an active treatment. But acute self-limited, it means uh, it is an acute condition of short duration with uh, yani, uh, good recovery response in most of the cases. It is usually seen in adolescent and young adults. This is the age, and about 10 to 20 uh, years age. Uh, the cause of this condition is by Epstein by virus, okay? EBV virus. And this virus, it is uh, one of the viruses of the herpes virus family. Here, the infection, uh, the clinical picture characterized by fever, uh, sore throat, and yani pain in the, in, the, in the pharyngeal area, and also we have a generalized lymphadenopathy. Okay, the patient, and why we are taking this infection here? Because the patient having generalized lymph node enlargement, generalized lymphadenopathy, okay, with fever and sore throat. The patient having fever, lymph node enlargement, and sore throat. In addition, we have lymphocytosis. We have an, an increase in the number of lymphocytes in the peripheral blood and in the tissue. And main uh, type of these lymphocytes are the CD8, which are the cytotoxic T lymphocytes. So the patient will have increased number of T lymphocytes in, in his body. And also we have generalized lymphadenopathy, sore throat, and fever. How the infection occurs, the transmission of the virus usually uh, occurs by direct oral contact and is usually seen in children, especially in the developing countries or in adolescent in the developed countries uh, due to uh, yani loss of hygiene, the sharing of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, yani equipment between the students and between the children uh, in the schools and in the nurseries. So there will be maybe transmission of this virus. And this virus initially will infect the epithelial cells of the oral pharynx and then it will separate to the lymphoid tissue okay so it will infect the epithelial cells after that it will go to the lymph, uh, lymphoid tissue especially the tonsils and the adenoids which are located in the oropharyngeal area where the mature b cells are infected so this virus mainly infecting the b lymphocyte the b lymphocyte which are locating in the tonsils and adenoids because you know that the tonsils are adenoids they are they are part of the mouth tissue they are because they associated lymphoid tissue it contains mature b lymphocyte inside the lymphoid follicles. These B lymphocytes will undergo latent infection with Epstein Barr virus. And this Epstein Barr virus may become activated, okay, and proliferate as a result of the action of several viral proteins. So the virus, after a latency period, it will become active and undergo replication. The, this infection, the B lymphocyte will trigger a T cell response. So the body will respond to this infection by a T cell response that will control the proliferation of the EBB infected B lymphocyte and it will control the spread of the virus. So the T cells, which are the, mainly the virus specific cytotoxic T cells, will appear in the circulation. And these virus specific T cells will uh, attack the virus uh, which is mainly located in the cell so the t lymphocyte will attacking the virus and it will prevent its replication it will prevent its spread and this virus specific uh, cytotoxic t lymphocyte will also appear in the peripheral blood as a typical lymphocyte this is uh, the appearance of these virus specific t lymphocytes they are called atypical because they, they will be large size they have a regular nuclear contour they have also the latest cytoplasm and also increase in the number of these uh, atypical lymphocytes. So these atypical lymphocytes are uh, appearing in the blood.
uh, may consider as a diagnostic sign of this infectious mononucleosis. So the morphological patterns or the morphological alteration, it will, there will be alteration in the peripheral blood, it will have alteration in the lymph node, in the spleen, in the liver, and uh, many other organs. The main uh, changes in the infectious mononucleosis, there will be peripheral leukocytosis. Yani, there will be increase in the white BC count. Okay, it will usually uh, 12,000 to 18,000 cells per uh, microliter, and typically more than half of these cells are atypical lymphocytes, okay, mainly CD8 uh, positive T cells. So we have increase in the white BC count, we call it leukocytosis, okay, and these leukocytes, when we examine them in the peripheral blood smear, they are atypical because they have uh, abnormal shape, so we call them atypical cells. The patient also we have a lymph node enlargement, okay, in the cervical area, in the axillary area, and the groin area generalized in vaginopathy, not focal, but it is generalized because the viral infection will become generalized infection. And histologically, with the large lymph nodes will be uh, floated by this atypical lymphocyte, and as we said, mainly occupying the paracortical area because it is a viral infection by Ipsian virus, and this type of viral infection will trigger a T cell response. It is it is infecting the B cells, but the response of our body will become through the T cells. So the T cells, the, the T cells will respond to this uh, virus, okay, and there will be enlargement of the paracortical area of the lymph node, okay, and this uh, it's, uh, paracortical area will be uh, floated by these atypical lymphocytes, okay. The spleen also will become enlarged because the spleen also contains lymphoid tissue with heavy infiltration of these atypical lymphocytes, and this splenic enlargement will become fragile because the spleen uh, uh, tissue is very soft. Uh, when it becomes fragile, it may undergo a rupture uh, after minor trauma. So very important. Those uh, Most of the patients are adolescents and children. So they are active, they are playing, they are uh, going on and out. So uh, very important to take a, a bed rest because the, their spleen will become fragile because it is and because spleen may get into this uh, inflammatory condition. So when this spleen enlargement, any minor trauma may result in the rupture of the spleen and the rupture of the spleen may result in uh, severe hemorrhage that may, uh, may, be, may, may be fatal in some cases. So the spleen are very important to, be, to, to keep the patient uh, at rest to, in order to not to undergo spleen rupture. Also, the liver there may undergo uh, filtration by these atypical lymphocytes and may result in hepatitis. So these are the atypical lymphocytes in the peripheral blood. So you can see the changes are seen in the peripheral blood, in the lymph node, in the spleen, in the liver, and many other organs. How does infectious mononucleosis infection is diagnosed by uh, many, uh, yeah, many ways? But the most important in this order of specificity, first of all, the most specific uh, condition is the presence of atypical lymphocytes in the peripheral blood. So we make a peripheral blood smear and we see these atypical lymphocytes, it is very specific for infectious mononucleus. Of course, with the clinical picture, with the history, with the uh, clinical signs of the patient. Okay, And then we have a positive uh, heterophil reaction called uh, a monospot test. And this is test uh, is mainly examining uh, the antibodies that are secreted from the these viral infected B cells. The viral infected B cells will release certain type of antibodies can be examined by this monospot test. For monospot test, it's a uh, diagnostic tool in infectious mononucleosis. The third uh, thing is rising titer of antibodies specific for EBV antigens. We can, if we can detect by serological test, the antibodies against the Ipsian virus antigen also uh, we can diagnose infectious mononucleosis. So we need uh, 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 CBC, Okay, but film, and we need a monospot test, and we need a serology for the antibodies against the EBV antigen. The uh, were acute, self-limited condition. Most of the patients will recover without even any uh, treatment or some sort of supportive treatment like antibiotic and other uh, uh, anti-inflammatory agents. But the minority of cases, we may have a complication. Well, this complication may include hepatic dysfunction. And liver failure, and mungkin liver uh, severe, uh, severe uh, hepatitis, and mungkin result in liver failure, the minority of condition. Also, there may be some con uh, complication involving the CNS, kidney, bone marrow, lung, eyes, heart, and even the spleen. Uh, as we said, the, the patient may undergo fatal spleen rupture. The, when the rupture of the spleen, uh, the spleen is very, very. Uh, uh, uh,
skin large and contain a lot of blood. So when we have a rupture inside the abdomen, the this blood, all this of this blood will go to the abdomen and the patient will end with hypovolemic shock. So uh, most of these patients will need uh, an urgent surgery in order to remove the spleen or uh, to suture the spleen if possible. Again, the ABP play a role in the pathogenesis of several types of T-cell lymphoma, especially those uh, lacking the T-cell immunity. Yani, some conditions may end with an lymphoma. Why? Because the EBV have a role in the pathogenesis of certain types of lymphoma that we will discuss, that, and this may result in lymphoma in those patients, especially in, in those immune-compromised patients. Some patients having uh, inherited immune deficiency, especially of the T-cell response, so they don't have a T-cell response against the EBV, so they may end with uh, an lymphoma because they don't have a T-cell response, so don't have immunity against the ABV, so the ABV will still uh, replicating and may result in a lymphoma. So these are the complications, but as we said, they are minor, they are infrequent, they are rare because most of the cases, they are acute and self-limited conditions. So by this, we are finishing all the inflammatory or reactive condition of uh, lymph node enlargement, as we said, either acute or chronic lymphadenopathy. Now we will start with introduction about the neoplastic proliferation of the plus cells. As we know, Neoplastic, it means a tumor, and it means a tumor, okay? Uh, proliferation, it means increase in the number of cells. So here we have an uh, increase in the number of YPC, not due to infection or not due to inflammation, but it is due to a tumorous condition. And this tumorous condition uh, in the blood, it is usually malignant, okay? Yani we don't have yani, a, a benign tumor in the blood. We don't have a benign uh, tumors in the, in, uh, at the level of the blood, at the level of the white blood cells. Okay? We don't have, uh, yani very rare to have a benign tumor. It is usually they are malignant tumors, okay? And these white blood cells, as you know, we have a lymphocyte, okay? Or we have uh, the other cell, the neutrophils or myeloid cells. And as you know, the, the white blood cells either lymphoid uh, uh, differentiation or the, the myeloid differentiation, okay? Or we may have histocytes, which are the macrophages, the dendritic cells, and so on. So the lymphoid cells, here lymphocytes, whether, whether B, whether T, whether NK cells, natural killer cells, these, when there's a tumor of these uh, group of cells, we call them lymphoma. Okay, yeah, and we have a lymphoma affecting the B cells, we have lymphoma affecting the T cells, or lymphoma of natural killer cell origin. Okay, this lymphoma uh, means malignant tumor of the lymphocyte. Lymphoma, uh, like in here, movie night, and had a misnomer, lymphoma here, malignant tumor affecting the lymphocytes. Okay, in my neoplasm, they, they are discussed in hematology. Of course, you are taking the AML, uh, acute myeloid leukemia, electronic myeloid leukemia, and so on. So we, we will not discuss the myeloid neoplasm, okay? But you have to know that the myeloid neoplasm are part of the neoplasm of the white blood cells. The other group, as we said, the histocytic proliferation of the macrophages, dendritic cells, Langerhans cells, all these are uh, macrophages. Macrophages, 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 So what are the etiological and pathological factors in white cell neoplasia? Yani certain pathogenic factors of certain risk factors of certain etiological condition that may trigger the uh, the occurrence of this lymphoma or leukemia. What are these factors? The most important thing, as you know, the chromosomal translocation. Yeah, the very important thing, or very important subject in uh, hematology or in leukemia or in lymphoma are the chromosomal translocations and mutations. Many of those patients having abnormality in the chrom their chromosomes or they have certain mutations then, or certain type of translocation that may result in a triggering of uh, the white cell uh, neoplasia, and this uh, these chromosomal translocation may uh, may cause neoplasia by three by three by three factors. Either they will increase the self renewal of cells, and when we have certain type of mutation, may result in increased self renewal. So the cells are still dividing, still dividing without any uh, thing that uh, prevent the increased self renewal. For certain type of mutation, they will prevent. A 
have you know that apoptosis is a programmed cell death, okay? So we need apoptosis to control the uh, proliferation. So what we do when we, we don't have apoptosis, okay, by certain type of mutation, there will be also triggering of cells to undergo the proliferation without inhibition, okay? Or sometimes we have increased cell division by the Wellberg metabolic effect that we will uh, discuss in the in your basic lecture, okay? So all these factors may result in uh, uh, triggering of, uh, of the, uh, the cells to undergo continuous replication and continuous division. By the way, uh, this uh, diagram is not uh, required for you because it is uh, an advanced uh, state, but you just to know that the chromosomal translocation may result in uh, tumors, and these tumors occur because there's either increase in the cell division or increase in the cell renewal or decrease apoptosis. I will not uh, any, uh, give you a question about this diagram because it contains some uh, any, uh, this information is advanced for you just to know the idea of the diagram that uh, we may have a chromosome translocation that will uh, trigger the uh, tumors of white blood cells. Okay? Uh, the other factors are inherited genetic factors. Some of them, again, we have inherited uh, genetic problems. The most common thing is the Down syndrome. Down syndrome, you take Down syndrome by some 21, and one of the manifestations or one of the complications of Down syndrome that some of them will have a leukemia. Okay, why they are having leukemia? Because they have a abnormality of their chromosomes, and this will increase the incidence of childhood leukemia. Again, some patients are having a neurofibromatosis. Okay, this is again a genetic disorder. Uh, we have type 1 and type 2. Those would have the type 1 also may have a leukemia or increased incidence of leukemia. Not all of them will have leukemia, but they are considered as a risk factor for leukemia. Some of them will have leukemia. Again, we have uh, some viral infections, okay, that may result in also white cell neoplasm. And this viral infection may include uh, HTLV1, which is uh, uh, human T cell leukemia virus, okay, one which is uh, associated with adult uh, T cell leukemia or lymphoma. So this uh, viral infection may result in leukemia or lymphoma, we call it adult is the leukemia or lymphoma. The EBV virus, as we said, the EBV is a preventive infectious mononucleosis, even we can ensure for the other type of lymphoma, the tuberculosis lymphoma, or even the Hodgkin lymphoma, even the lymphoma, the Hodgkin tuberculosis, it could be triggering monitor or the other risk factors monitor here digital viral infection with the virus. HHV8, HHV8, the sarcoma, it is here in HIV patients, it's a opportunistic infection by HHV8, HHV8, like a pussy sarcoma, or even the unusual B cell lymphoma that may present as a malignant pleural effusion. So these viral infection, HTLV1, EV virus, HHV8, they are also triggering factors for lymphomas or leukemia. Okay? Sometimes we have, we have a chronic inflammatory condition also associated with development of lymphoma. And the examples include H. pylori infection that you will take in the stomach, inshallah, in the GI cord, you will take the H. pylori infection in the gas mucosa. And this H. pylori infection uh, will result in a chronic inflammation in the gastric mucosa, and this may result in also lymphoma inside the stomach. We call it gastric B cell lymphoma due to the chronic inflammation and chronic infection by H. pylori microorganism. Also, in those patients having a gluten sensitive enteropathy, the celiac disease, either at the home at the time, the GI system, to my celiac disease, either in the complication in cell and the patient with celiac disease, well, intestinal T cell lymphoma, either more. Cancer at the form, either can yeah, for long duration or uncontrolled uh, severe symptoms, who can donate the lymphoma by the Ashley in the Ashley Center. Even uh, nowadays, uh, many patients having breast implant uh, due to mastectomy, they, they, they may make a silicone implant uh, after removal of the breast by mastectomy for cancer or other conditions. This breast implant nowadays also associated with T cell lymphoma because this implant uh, contains silicon and this silicon triggers chronic irritation and chronic inflammation that may uh, also trigger a T cell lymphoma development. Uh, again, the HIV infection. And when we take HIV in immunopathology lectures, we said that there is increased incidence of certain type of tumors, okay, especially the primary B cell form of the brain and other organs. So all these 
respiratory infection, celiac disease, uh, breast implants, HIV infection, all of them may trigger lymphoma development. Uh, again, we have certain atrogenic factors. What do we mean by atrogenic? Atrogenic means due to treatment or due to uh, certain maneuvers or certain uh, procedures done by the doctors. Okay. Uh, atrogenic factor may include radiation therapy and chemotherapy used for uh, treatment of cancer, increase the risk of subsequent myeloid or lymphoneoplasm due to mitogenic effect. Can you breast cancer or GI cancer, okay, colon cancer? And then remove the radiation or chemotherapy. What well, is the side effect of radiation or side effect of chemotherapy? In the mumkin, so we mutation, we add the lymphoma. Can you imagine that breast cancer? Aminal mastectomy, we have lymph node metastasis, so we have radiation in the area. This is a shower. This is a shower. واحدة من the one of the things that can lead to lymphoma or leukemia in the body. The body can be affected by one of the things that can lead to leukemia or lymphoma. But this is a shower. Of course, it will be an indication of the radiation or chemotherapy. We will not be able to do it because of the general body. واحدة من المضاعفات واحدة من المشاكل اللي تصير ممكن هو ديفلوبمنت اوف لوكيميا ايضا شافوا السموكينج انكريز انسدنس اوف اكيوت مايلو لوكيميا باي 1.3 تو 3 فولز ان السموكرز بيكوز اوف ذا اكسبوجر اوف ذا كارسيوجينيك السموكر ممكن يكون في ميني كارسيوجينيك افكتس او ميني كارسيوجينيك سبستانسز ذات ميل ريزلت ان اولسو ديفلوبمنت اوف تريجرينج اوف لمفوما لوكيميا The last slide you just have a definition about what is lymphoma and what is leukemia. Yeah, just to, to keep in mind what is lymphoma and what is leukemia. What is the difference between leukemia and lymphoma? Okay, the leukemia it means malignant neoplasm that are presented with wide separate involvement of the bone marrow. Okay, yeah, and you can the malignant tumor. Okay, this malignant tumor originating from the myeloid met, uh, or cells or the primitive cells that are located in the bone marrow, okay? And then it will spread in the bone marrow and spread in the peripheral blood, we call it leukemia. Yeah, and any, any patient having involvement of the bone marrow, the involvement of the peripheral blood extensively by uncontrolled uh, neoplastic cells, uh, malignant cells, infiltrating leaf bone marrow, infiltrating the peripheral blood, and so with a CBC, with uh, white blood cells count, and so with a complete blood picture, and show no YBC elevated, we show the morphology. الجي مرة ثانية مثل ما أخذتوا في المحاضرة راح تكون أبنورم إن شيب عن بالجنان نيوبلاستيك سيلز فهذا المريض نسميه عنده لوكيميا زين بينما المريض إذا إجى بشكل مالينات بروليفريشن أوف ذا وايت بلاس سيلز which is typically the lymphoid size and they are present with secret tissue masses يعني يجي بشكل lymph node enlargement يجي بشكل وايت بلاس enlargement axillary enlargement زين ونفحص السي بي سي مادة نفحص البومبر يكون نظيف فهذا المريض نسميه لمفو إذن فإذا الـ white blood cell uh, tumors يا أما تجي على شكل leukemia يكون عندي white separate involvement of the bone marrow white separate involvement of the peripheral blood mainly فهذا يكون leukemia بينما من تجي الـ white uh, blood cell neoplasm على شكل masses شكل lymph node enlargement بالـ neck بالـ axilla بالـ coin mainly ويكون الـ bone marrow ماله نظيف والـ blood ماله أيضا راح يكون نظيف هذا البريد نسميه لمفوما فإذا لازم نعرف أن اللوكيميا تفرق عن اللمفوما اللوكيميا هي مرض حالة يصير بالـ bone marrow والـ أكثر من بقية الأماكن بينما اللمفوما هي ميل يصير بالـ بالـ اثنيناتهم عبارة عن malignant tumors اثنيناتهم هي عبارة عن malignant tumors of the white blood cells لكن اختلاف الـ distribution of these uh, tumors يعطينا uh, two terms اللي هي لوكيميا and lymphoma. ومثل ما احنا نعرف في المحاضرة القادمة اللمفوما نوعين يعني اللمفوما mainly نحكي عن اللمفوما اللي هي malignant tumors of the lymphocytes they are mainly either Hodgkin lymphoma أو نون هوشكين لمفوما نوعين أيضا رح ناخذها في المحاضرة القادمة أما تكون نون هوشكين تايب أو نون هوشكين لمفوما. And this is my reference and thank you. you for your listening. If you have any question or comment, I'll be able to ask you in the chat or if you want to call the mic, I'll be able to ask you.